Okay, welcome. This is a workshop summary video from the um, PhD Qualitative Research Program <coughs> from January 2015. The workshop was entitled Grounded Theory in Action. Um, I'm Dave Pigott, and um, over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk through um, the slides. We won't get into the activities, obviously, but I'll, I'll talk over the slides and, and relate back some of the material. So, the first thing was the outline of the session. It was a four parter beginning with some concepts and processes, uh, an application task, and then getting into some of the history and debate, and then taking a critical stance on grounded theory. Um, I began by um, talking about the basic characteristics of grounded theory, and I used um, uh, Mike Weed's paper from 2009 um, just as a, as a way of uh, getting, to the, getting down to the basics of grounded theory. Now, Weed talked about eight characteristics. Um, some other people um, will tell you that there are six, some will tell you there are seven, some will say nine. Um, so this is just this is just one of many versions, but in effect we went through this um, exercise of writing down the characteristics on post-it notes, having a discussion about what we thought they meant, and sticking them on a flip chart paper based on how we thought they um, sat together or how they went together as a process. Now, my version of this is that ground theory, or in fact any research, begins with theoretical sensitivity. So this concept here, and this is this comes from Herbert Bloomer's notion of sensitizing concepts, which is effectively that the the idea that we begin research with um, a set of ideas, a set of theories and concepts in our minds that guide the kind of questions we ask and how we interpret people's responses. So theoretical sensitivity is there all the time. It's like the the backdrop uh, on our, of our knowledge, our background knowledge, which influences everything we do all the time. Once you have developed theoretical sensitivity in an area, typically what people would do is go into uh, a process of theoretical sampling. So this is where you choose uh, to sample a particular person or place based on uh, them satisfying some theoretical criteria. Now initially that might just be a sort of an initial random sample or you might go to somebody for a particular reason but once the research begins it becomes uh, the sampling is guided by the emerging theory. Um, which takes us on to um, an iterative process. So ground theory then once you start to sample um, is a process, or an iterative process of data collection and data analysis. So you move between bouts of collecting data, um, analysing it, making sense of it, um, sampling again, then collection and analysis. And we go in basic spirals or iterations of collection and analysis. Um, this, within this iterative process, we have a something called a constant comparison process, which is where you're constantly comparing either data, one data source to another and trying to understand the differences and similarities or between data and existing concepts that you've generated. So constant comparison describes this idea of we're constantly comparing data to data or data to concepts and it's through that constant comparative process that we develop some initial thoughts and we do that in the form of concepts and memos. So in grounded theory we have this idea of um, open coding initially where you almost code line by line um, which eventually becomes um, in Strauss and Corbin's version at least axial coding and then categorical coding so as we go through more and more iterations of data collection and analysis we develop more concepts at a higher level of abstraction and eventually we start to write memos just to, to articulate our thoughts about what these concepts mean how they relate to one another and so forth um, eventually we will reach a point of theoretical saturation. So you go through enough iterations, enough constant comparisons to reach a point of saturation where you basically don't feel like you're finding anything new, where you've got some well-established core categories that, that fit together, that explain the data. Um, and at that point we have, or should have developed, a substantive theory. So this is the end product of a grounded theory, is a substantive theory um, which is grounded in the data, you know, which is anchored in the data that you have and explains virtually everything that you've that you've collected. Um, and this last note was to do with fit, work and relevance. And these are the criteria uh, which we used to judge the, the quality of a, of a substantive theory. So a theory should fit the data, 
it should work for the participants of the research, the the, uh, the subjects of the research, and it should be relevant to them. They should be able to recognise it. So we apply this criteria to a substantive theory, um, and those are the basic characteristics of of grounded theory. So we got them down onto um, a flip chart, and we described that process. Now, once we've done that, we went into um, an action research process, so we, we actually got into doing a ground of theory study, we had a go at it, um, people taking different roles of supervisor, researcher and, and participants, um, and we saw how these um, processes were carried out uh, live in action in a piece of research. Um, emerging from that, I, I showed you this diagram which is effectively uh, just an example, a flow diagram of how I went about, or how I described doing my ground of theory study, my PhD. Um, and and here you can see again some of these core concepts of theoretical sensitivity. This is the, the sort of background knowledge here all the, all the, that was there all the time. Um, and I formulated initial research problems, collected data, uh, theor through theoretical sampling, moved through bouts of analysis and hypothesizing, reformulating the problem, collecting more data, and so on and so forth. Um, and the idea was that these initial uh, iterations began quite wide picking up lots of things um, and I did at this point I was doing uh, focus groups with children so I was doing open questions, likes, dislikes, really open um, you know gathering wide open data in effect at this point but the idea is that as you go through your um, iterations in grounded theory you become more and more narrow so you develop clearer and clearer ideas about what you're finding out uh, to the point where you come to the substantive theory at the end. So as you can see the methods that I used changed as I went through. So as we became more narrow we moved to more one-to-one -one interviews, more closed questions, using other techniques like vignettes where you present people with a story and ask them to say what they think about the story. So the idea is that you develop clearer hypotheses in effect which you which you test out through your data collection, ongoing data collection. Um, so this is just an example from some research, research that I did uh, a few years ago. But again, you can see the key characteristics here, sensitivity, sampling, the iterative process, the constant comparison, uh, substantive theory, and so forth. Now, I went on from there to give you a brief outline of the um, history of, of grounded theory and where it came from. So um, on the left here, I've got some kind of key texts or chapters and on the right, um, the kind of basic inspiration that I drew from, from each one. So, Grounded Theory was developed by Glazer and Strauss in 1967, following some work that they'd published, Awareness of Dying, in, in 1965. Um, and basically, people were asking them to, people were impressed with the research they'd done on dying and wanted to know how they'd gone about doing it. So, they developed this book or wrote this book, The Discovery of Grounded Theory. Um, <clears throat> now, it's it's important to point out that this book is a, a, is a polemic in effect. It's it's not a um, it's not a sort of robust set of arguments. It's it's meant to be persuasive, um, and this it's meant to be persuasive because at the time in in sociology, people typically were doing lots of verifying research, taking grand theories like functionalism, Marxism, and just verifying them um, and saying yes, the world is explained in this way. So Glazer and Strauss wanted to say well. No, this doesn't work and we want to develop middle range theories which are discovered or which are new which are developed by doing new fresh empirical uh, data collection so they have some sort of connection and resonance with the with the people who they are, who have been studied um so this was the basic purpose of the 67 text um after that uh, 10 years later glazer barney glazer um wrote a sort of an update text called theoretical sensitivity where he tried to deal with some of the um, criticisms, critique of grounded theory that had gone on. Um, beyond that, we get uh, another 10 years, Strauss and Corbin then enter the field and develop a, a more student friendly text, um, more like a how to do grounded theory, which is a bit more technical. And Glazer didn't like that. In 1992, he wrote a rebuttal, which was basically saying that what he saw in Strauss and Corbin text wasn't grounded theory anymore, he called it forced conceptual description. So this is where we get this notion of a split between Glazer and Strauss. Um, Strauss and Corbin updated their text in 1998 and this is kind of the core text which people 
typically use now when doing grounded theory. So here they they articulate a, a more of a constructionist position where Glaze was very positivist um, and developed some new techniques um, to help with the doing of grounded theory. Um, then we get uh, Kathy Chalmers entering in, in 2000 with a book chapter in the uh, Handbook of Qualitative uh, Research and uh, here she sort of clarifies this nature of the Glazer-Strauss split and she introduces what she calls a constructivist revision of Grana theory um, and that's updated a further 10 years later with Chalmers and Anthony Bryant's work an edited text where they update some of the debates and they bring in new ways of thinking about Grana theory so um, it's worthwhile digging into all of these texts if you want to get a sense of the history and the development of the methodology. Um, and I've just given you a really basic overview here. Um, it's important to point out that there are sort of philosophical differences. So we've got these, I suppose we, we exist now in a stage where we have three versions, if you like. So the Glazerian, the Straussian and the, and the Charmazian or the constructivist revision each of which are, take quite different positions. So if you read back in the Glazer and Strauss text and Glazer's updated texts, what we see is a sort of fairly naive realist position. So they talk about emergence and discovery as if the world is out there ready ready to be uh, discovered by us. Um, the epistemological position is, is positivist. It's this idea that, uh, that the observer can that researcher can observe without the you know your theory neutral observer you we're doing induction um, and you know Glazer says things like the researcher must trust that emergence will occur and it does so you can see that fairly clear position there um, Strauss and Corbin a bit more um, jump about a bit more their ontological position is is constructivist in a sense um, they acknowledge the role of the researcher in constructing the, the social world with, with um, social actors. Epistemologically, though, they're quite pragmatist. Um, for them, theories are useful constructs. They don't necessarily represent an external reality. You know, the, the theories need to work and be relevant to, but they don't necessarily represent uh, reality. Um, Chalmers, on the other hand, is a bit more kind of going constructivist um, but she does have some critical realist elements and that's what Mike Weed picks up and you've read some of her work you, you kind of get a sense of that there um, and she claims to be sort of taking a symbolic interactionist approach but um, again she's probably quite pragmatic in her in her, in her epistemological position again like Strauss and Corbin so we've got these three different versions three different views and they've all got slightly different philosophical positions which is which is interesting and, and probably something you need to start to develop a stance on. Um, I then went in to talk about um, epistemic insecurity and the, this notion that grounded theory can provide us with some sort of security. So social sciences, particularly in, in psychology, we have this position where people are scared of or we've, we've moved away from naive positivist approaches um, to study, but people don't want to go... Um, into full-blown relativism either. So grounded theory, I think, gives people a, a nice sort of halfway point. It feels rigorous. It feels like there's a system there, but it acknowledges that <clears throat> you know we, we might be able to um, improve our knowledge, or you know our substantive theories can improve if we use certain uh, criteria and certain standards and follow certain procedures. So we don't go all the way to to sort of full-blown relativism. Um, <clears throat> and then I went into this debate about uh, that Kathy Chalmers highlights who's got the real ground of theory, um, and you know there are different positions here that I that I highlighted that I I don't really want to go into um, in these review slides too much because it's more of a discussion and a debate. The point being that um, I suppose uh, while some people like Weed think that there are, there is a particular ground of theory, a way of doing it, you know, a, uh, what he calls a a total methodology. There are other people who argue that. You know, we can be much more flexible in how we use it. You know, we don't have to follow these eight characteristics or essences, um, <clears throat> as we put them. Um, and then I finally illustrated my own critical stance on crown of theory. So um, this was the, the position I published in my 2010 paper. And this is me basically saying that of these eight characteristics that Weed talks about, personally, I think only four of them are you know, are, are definitely uh, characteristics of grounded theory. The others you could definitely debate. So that was where I finished up um, on the presentation.